Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the second day of the first international conference on ESP teaching at the crossroads of the marketplace demands. So today we have a plenary session and afterwards uh, we, we shall have eight parallel uh, panels. So we'll be starting with the plenary session with three keynote speakers. We have with us Dr. Wasila Eitel Judy from Southampton University, the UK. We have Professor Karen Ferreira Mayers from the Institute of Distance Education, the University of Eswatini. And we have uh, Professor Ahmed Shawki Hwajli from the University of Biskra, Algeria. We shall start with Dr. Wasila Eitel Judy with a presentation entitled English Medium Instruction, EMI Implementation in the Algerian Higher Education. Um, okay, thank you so much for the introduction, Manel. Um, yeah, and thank may, you I, for... may I just say something about you before you start? Yeah, go okay. ahead. <laughs> yeah. So Wasila has a Doctor of Philosophy from the University of Southampton, the UK. She's a research assistant at the same university. Uh, she has been an EAP lecturer at the, at the same university and more recently at the University of Portsmouth. Uh, she has two insightful, or she has published two insightful book chapters, and uh, she has two book chapters and three articles ongoing. She has participated in more than 20 conferences. She ran 25 seminars at Southampton University. She is a journal editor, and her research interests lie in gender and cultural representations in language education, inclusivity and power relation, the promotion of autonomy in language teaching, language assessment, English as a medium of instruction, and the evolving landscape of world Englishes. So, Wasila, the floor is yours. Thank you, Manel, for the introduction. Um, um, let me first say that I'm so honored to participate in the conference and uh, thank you so much for uh, inviting me as a keynote speaker in this um, international conference. Um, so I've been listening to most of the talks yesterday. Um, they have been discussing ESP and its recent trends in, um, in either in Algeria or international context. Um, already Manel introduced me and she let you know what is my research interest and uh, what is my research background in general. So um, in today's presentation, uh, I would like to talk about the EMI implementation in the Algerian higher education and focus, and focus on the um, teachers' attitudes and their preparedness to this recent policy that is introduced by the Ministry of Higher Education in Algeria. So, um, uh, focus. So, in, if you follow my presentation uh, with the next twenty minutes or so, you would uh, learn about the recent trend of EMI and the uh, future of EMI in the Algerian higher education. Um, I've divided my presentation into six parts. So, in the first part, I would like to introduce the rationale of conducting this research, why I conducted it. And then I will give you the research questions and the objectives that guided my project. Afterwards, I will conceptualize the key uh, concepts, which is EMI, and um, compare it with other uh, related terms. Um, and then I will give you a brief introduction about my methodology, how I conducted it, with whom and where I conducted it. And also, um, I will share the key findings and then I will give a key takeaways that I would I would like you to um, go away from my presentation with these key takeaways or questions in your mind, hopefully. Um, so let's start with the first part of my presentation. So yeah, um, given that English um, plays a key role or a global role in um, in nowadays in, in different um, parts of the uh, 
of our lives, either in education or in communication or traveling around the world. So um, this has, um, of course, this has uh, uh, received an extensive attention from policymakers. Um, in, and this led to the introduction of EMI, English as Medium of Instruction programs. These programs meant to uh, use English as a medium of instructions. And it also, um, this program has spread quickly in different uh, parts of the world, including European context, UK and Asian context, as well as recently in Middle East and North African contexts. So um, the driving forces for the, um, for the spread of this EMI program um, emanates um, primarily from the aim of in uh, of internal of internationalizing the higher education institution. So most of the institution want their context to be internationalized and uh, will welcome different uh, in, like uh, different guests from different universities, not just locally. So they wanted to internationalize it. And another aim is um, to enhance, um, to promote the easy access to science, technology, and the um, knowledge that is uh, in English, uh, written in English language, and also to enhance um, the, like this way, when, when we see that EMI is, is giving us a chance to access uh, technology and science, most of the governments see it as a way to improve their revenues, their um, like economic capital, and they are also their um, international relations with different uh, uh, countries, trans transnational relations, like Risiga call it. And also, it, it, the government wants to enhance students' overall um, competitiveness and their communication skills in order to access the um, global marketplace. So against this backdrop, um, Algerian context also has introduced or has aimed to reach these aims through introducing EMI, through introducing English as medium of instruction in order to be like the, um, the key gateway uh, to reach the global market and to also um, improve the quality of education in the Algerian context. Um, so EMI is strongly uh, supported by the uh, key governmental policies, such as the higher education reform agenda that is introduced recently, and, the, um, and also the National Foreign Languages Project that aims to improve um, foreign languages in the Algerian context. Um, so as I said, they wanted to improve the um, education and also reach the global context. However, when we look at the literature or when we look at the research conducted so far, EMI remains less researched in North African context, specifically in Algeria, as it's uh, the, especially when we consider its blossoming way, like it's, it's recently introduced in the Algerian context. We can see that few, few studies have been conducted, but we need more research to theorize and to learn more ways of doing and ways of practicing um, this policy, whether it's a success or we need more improvements in this term. So um, in this sense, I wanted to fill this gap and I conducted re this research um, aiming to explore the implementation of English medium of instruction in Algerian higher education, focusing primar primarily on investigating lecturers' ways of thinking primarily, um, their preparedness and attitudes. So um, specifically, I wanted to answer three research questions, which are, what are the attitudes of teachers towards EMI? And uh, how well prepared do the Algerian teachers um, in their move from uh, like different like from the previous policy, uh, we can call it like FMI, French as medium of instruction, or other language medium of instruction, to AMI policy. And also, I wanted to raise the issue of what, what are the challenges they may face if they apply EMI in their uh, classrooms. Um, so after introducing these research questions and before moving to how I conducted this project, I would like to introduce key concepts, how, how I uh, position myself or how I define uh, EMI in my project in this way. 
So as this project uh, revolves around uh, the concepts of e English medium of instruction policy, um, it is very necessary that I will clarify for you what does it mean uh, by this terminology. So generally, it is understood from its term, EMI, which is um, the use of English for as a medium of instruction, where English is, uh, is used as a language of teaching and learning for lecturers and students whom their language is not, whom English is not their native language, is not their L1, but it is um, either a second or a foreign language, but in Algeria is uh, considered as a foreign language, a second foreign language. So English medium uh, of instruction generally refers to the use of English as an instructional language uh, for teaching disciplinary knowledge, for teaching the content of the discipline uh, to students and um, also, um, as I said, as a foreign language for them. Um, other terms have also been mentioned to refer to the use of um of the of English as a medium of instruction, as we can see from the uh, like the um, diagram, or we can say it like a, a line graph, um, no, like a process that says how these two like different terms related to EMI, like EAP and CLIL, um, content integrated language learning. So we have EAP, which is English for academic purposes and clear um, content integrated language learning. And we have also EMI. So we wonder what is the difference between these terms as they come uh, when we refer to English as medium of instruction. We have these three terms that comes up in our mind and it's trendy uh, when we look at research, we find always confusing terms between EMI, EAP and CLIL. So CLIL, is a dual focused educational approach in which an additional language is used for the learning and teaching of both content and language. The issue of terminology here is, is, is a little bit complex, because but EMI is arguably an umbrella term for academic subjects taught through English. So we, we are focusing here on the subject, not the language learning, but rather the subject knowledge taught in English. Um, and also it is a term used across the world and usually in higher education when we refer to um, EMI. And CLIL is a term which originated in and in almost um, like usually used in Europe, but recently is spreading towards different contexts as well. And when we come to English for academic purposes, uh, we can see that EAP in, involves using English to teach the language skills like research skills, um, academic skills, writing skills. So this is like the aim, use the language to achieve the academic goals. So um, I hope I made it clear how these three terms differ. differ. So one of them, EAP, is focusing on language skills. Uh, CLIL is focusing on both language and content. And e EMI is focusing on the content or the subject knowledge taught in English. Uh, it doesn't matter the improvements of uh, English, but it differs, like we cannot like restrict it in one bubble because different teachers conceptualize it their ways when they go to the classrooms. But this is how I view it myself in my project. So after giving a brief introduction or um, defining the key concepts that um, guides my project, I would like to take you to the methodology part, which is how I conducted this research. Um, so I started with the idea of uh, employing an ethnographic approach that is uh, orienti orienting a mixed methodology, qualitative and quantitative uh, design with a case study design, which is like I used a case study, not um, like a like a different universities. I used one sample just to um, get deep findings on that matter. In order to collect the data, I've used uh, surveys, interviews, and also I uh, analyzed some documents and e informal conversations with the lecturers specifically. So I have used thematic analysis to analyze the uh, qualitative part of my study and descriptive statistic with the, to analyze the few quantitative parts that I have in my study, because it's, um, it is more qualitative than quantitative. 
And then I have also uh, recruited 72 participants from Eastern, uh, from Northeastern University in Algeria. So um, I would like to give you a brief introduction about these lecturers because this will help you to understand the key findings that I will share with you in a minute. So, um, so these teachers, as we can see from the table, uh, we have a range of different experiences. We have those who have like from zero to 10 years of experience, we have those who have more experience, like 10, uh, 10 years uh, to 20. And we have also more experience, like 30 plus or 20 plus. So um, when we look at the table, we can see like 30, uh, 62 of them have experience of 0 to 10 and 27 have more than 10. And also we have 9% of them have uh, more uh, than 20 to 30 years uh, of, of teaching experience, I mean. So these teachers are coming from different departments and they have experience, expertise in different subjects, like you can see in the table as well. We have law, um, psychology, engineering, social sciences, natural sciences, and uh, so forth, like different departments in the um, University of uh, Eastern Algeria. So after you have um, known a little bit about my research participants, let's now uh, dig deeper to the findings. Um, because of the limited time that I have today, I'm not going to share all the findings. It's not possible in a short presentation, but I would like to share with you the findings that I have um, found in my survey and the interviews. So let's first start. I have three research questions. So the first question is asking, what are the attitudes? So uh, in, in answering the question, what are the attitudes of the teachers towards EMI? I found that most of the teachers have positive, uh, positive attitudes uh, towards EMI and uh, towards using English as medium of instruction. And also we have nearly 46% of them saying like we support this idea of EMI while 30 percent share a, a neutral they are neither like positive nor negative and also we have uh, like some of them um, like resist the uh, policy as you can see in the pie chart for um so now when we see these percentages, we, we wouldn't understand what are the factors that led them say, um, I support this uh, policy, I don't support it, I am in the in between. But I have asked them to share with me why they think um, th they have positive attitudes, negative attitudes towards EMI or neutral attitudes. As we can see on the table, so those who shared positive attitudes, they recognized the global role of English and associated it as a language of academy. What does it mean? Which means that they enable them uh, to access knowledge, science and technology because they think like English is related to the like the word of publishing, the word of uh, knowing and uh, learning different, sorry, different knowledge. Um, and also, when we move on to the second column of the table, we see that neutral uh, attitudes towards EMI. So those who share neutral attitudes, they highlighted the need for embracing the translanguaging nature of the country in which they say like, okay, uh, EMI is good, but why we limit our classrooms to one language? It should be like different languages uh, and it should be like the preference of the students rather than just using English as a medium of instruction. Uh, which we will find true when we go to the classroom practices because teachers may struggle to find a word so they can use another language which is native language Arabic or um, they can also use French uh, for those who used to teach in French uh, previously. Um, and the third part is like uh, sharing negative attitudes. When we look at the column of neg negative attitudes we can see that those who see uh, who have a resistant or like um, let's say they refused using AMI, um, they said that our concerns is the uh, like the challenges related to using EMI in this short time plan that yeah, they have in their hands. So they see, they think that it is, it is like it's basically the language barriers that makes it like a resistant 
like makes it difficult for them to embark in EMI policy. And they also say that we lack English resources in our libraries, which may um, which may like leave the um, gap between what they see in their classrooms. Um, like they say, we we will bring a gap for the students when they are in the classroom. They will learn in English, but when we ask them to do research in the library, they will find most of the references are in Arabic or in French, because they said. Uh, technology is not uh, really accessible in the uh, context of the university, but still um, at the library they couldn't find much resources written in English in their subject matter. Or at least they couldn't like find it a way to explain it clearly for the students. Um, and they also expressed the uh, limitation, the time limitation. They think that they have a long history of teaching in French for uh, scientific subjects, for example, engineering, business, and so on. So they think they will have, they will need more time to convert those materials to English materials before embarking to uh, uh, implement the EMI policy in the classroom. So given these varying attitudes uh, that we can see on the table, um, the question that we can ask now how far, how well the teachers are prepared? Are they prepared truly to go to um, to introduce EMI in their classrooms, or they still need some time to shift to this EMI policy? So, in order to see this answer, let's uh, look at the pie chart I have shared with you on the slide. It tells us a little bit how prepared or not according to the confidence level. So, I choose the confidence level because it tells us more about the um, the feelings of the teachers towards their readiness uh, uh, in using English as a medium of instruction. So as we can see on the pie chart, um, nearly 48% of my participants feel ready to embark by sharing a, a feeling of very confident or confident. So these two, conf these two levels of confidence, I group them in one as being ready. Uh, and while only 60% show no confidence in teaching in English and 34% share a less confidence feeling to use in English as a medium of instruction. They were, they were asked to justify as well because we cannot understand from just these percentages how well they are prepared unless we see the factors behind their confidence or low confidence to teach in English. So uh, the next slide will show us like how prepared or unprepared according to the factors. And you can see also some quotes if you want to read them. Um, I'm not going to read them for you, but uh, you can go and read them yourself if you would like to learn a lot about that. So when I, I asked them to justify why they think they are confident to teach English, why they are not confident. So um, the justification provide insight into the diverse factors influencing their uh, confidence levels. So, for example, those who say we are confident, uh, the instructors conceptualizing EMI, um, they have like they have an enthusiasm towards English. This is why they think they are very confident to teach in English. They also have engage in ongoing language learning. They are still learning the English language while preparing to be an EMI teachers and possess formal education in English. Some of them, they are, they are they also have like a second diploma in English. They are in their second years to learning English um, apart from their teaching subjects, but apart from their lectureship uh, in their subjects of expertise. Sorry. So um, those confident ones, they... Um, they cite moderate English proficiency. They think that they are confident to teach, but they have like a, a moderate confidence towards English. They can successfully teach in English, but they have like a cross language teaching skills, uh, like as a, as a factor for them to be confident in teaching. Like they say, they think they are flexible, whether teaching in English or in other language, it doesn't matter as far as they know the subject content. For those who share like uh, less confidence at, uh, at it, uh, attributes their lower confidence to a lack of 
prior English teaching experience. So they think it's their first time to teach in English, so that makes them less confident to use English as a medium of instruction. And they also raised concerns about potential language errors. So they think they should be like uh, perfect language English language speakers in order to teach in English. Um, that means they conceptualize it with the native speakerism approach in which we see like a language as, a, as, as it should be a native-like um, proficiency in order to teach it to others. And those who say like, uh, we are not confident at all, um, they think they are not prepared and they need more trainings. They think they, uh, they have a lack of language skills as well. Um, and they have some like anxiety towards or apprehension towards using English as medium of instruction because of their long history of teaching in French or in Arabic. So this diverse perspective um, show us like the complex interplay of linguistic proficiency, teaching experiences, and their perceptions toward shaping their classrooms within the trend of EMI or English as medium of instruction. So after we learned about the preparedness, as it's our second question, like preparedness of lecturers towards using EMI, let's now move on to the challenges they have uh, cited they may face during their EMI classrooms. So um, teachers think that teaching in English, as we can see on the table on our, in our slides, like teachers think that teaching in English uh, mid, as a medium of instruction poses six challenges. So uh, the challenges they think, uh, first of them, uh, Okay, so first of them is in, um, instructors may face difficulty due to the inadequate, uh, inadequate English language proficiency, uh, impacting their ability to effectively convey information. They think if they don't have the language skills, they couldn't convey uh, content uh, effectively. The second is adapting course content to suit an EMI environment. They think they already have materials written in French or Arabic, and that will cause like a barrier for them and it will cause like, um, like a challenge to uh, adapt it to English, to, uh, to convert them into English materials. And the third one is the uh, like a lack of appropriate teaching materials in English. They think that they don't have like enough English materials uh, available for them to use in their uh, subject of expertise. For example, one of them said, in law, for example, we cannot just use materials written in Arabic um, and then we explain them in English. We, we should have like an English material to help us like use the accurate keyword for them to understand. Uh, so as we, 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 we will not miss the key terminologies in our fields or we can use the Arabic terms while we teach them in, in English. So this is like a quote that, I, that I remained in my mind. Uh, another challenge that they have mentioned, they said that um, students may resist. So they think that some of students are not ready yet to be taught in English. They think their language proficiency as well will, make, will be a barrier for them to enjoy the MMI classrooms. Uh, fifth barrier, fifth challenge is that the administrative or policy barriers. That which uh, what I mean by this is that the teachers think they they lack specialized um, training, and also the um, also they lack um, they lack like um, a core like they lack um, a time to embark in that content by uh, receiving like a very specific training in their subject of expertise. So they think they need to go abroad and uh, learn a little bit about their subject matters in English and then come back to the, con the country and uh, use English as a medium of instructions. The final, the last but not the least, um, a challenge of achieving a balance between English language instruction and subject matter delivery. What, I, what, I, what, do, what do they mean by this? My participant shared a, like uh, some claims saying that Usually, when we teach in the language that we really master, it makes it easy for us to explain smoothly for the students the content of their subject of expertise. But when they um, um, they use English, they think they may, they might miss some of the explanation 
necessary for the student to understand the content of the subject matter. So here we go. So these are the challenges they have shared. Uh, moving towards the uh, end of my presentation. So to conclude my presentation, I hope I hope I made it clear from the start until the uh, the end that um, there are diverse perspectives from the lecturers that I have uh, either surveyed or interviewed on the introduction of English as a medium of instruction in the Algerian higher education context. They also, they also expressed some positive attitudes by realizing the global importance of the English language, while others raised some concerns related to their unreadiness to teach in English due to the low language proficiency barriers, language English language proficiency barriers. They have also highlighted the need for additional English resources and teaching materials with specialized overseas training on the subject of their expertise. It is clear that this shift requires thoughtful consideration, a strategic gradual implementation to ensure a successful transition and positive out outcomes for both educators and students. The success of EMI in Algerian higher education will depend on a range of factors, including the availability of resources, the quality of training, and like ongoing support provided to teachers and the willingness of all stakeholders to embrace the changes required. Thank you for your attention and uh, any questions are welcome. These are the references that I have used in order to uh, conduct this project. Thank you for your attention. I hope I have not exceeded the time limit. <laughs> well, you are the only one on stage, so take your time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. Uh, thank you so much, Wasila, for sharing with us the results of your uh, research as far as EMI in Algeria is concerned. And uh, we can see that EMI has become a trend in Algeria since the Minister, the Minister of Higher Education and Scientific Research has introduced this new correspondence that encourages teachers to teach their subject matters in English. Yeah. So your, uh, your study is um, informative and it is impactful because it raises... Um, uh, uh, important concerns about this target group's attitudes, uh, preparedness, and challenges. So you shared with us the hurdles that these participants are facing throughout this training, and which may be uh, or may, which may pave the way through finding solutions as far as needs analysis, uh, curriculum, and syllabus design are concerned. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So now Karen hasn't joined yet. So I'm going to play her presentation and afterwards we'll have the discussion. Okay. I will mute myself. Sure.
Good morning. Uh, it's a real pleasure for me to be here with you at this ICESP 2023 first multidisciplinary hybrid international conference on ESP teaching at the crossroads of the marketplace demands. I am recording myself because I am not sure how strong my internet connection uh, is. So I hope to interact with you immediately after this short intervention. The title of my presentation is Virtual Reality, Augmented Reality and Artificial Intelligence for Better Learning Outcomes in English with Specific Purposes or for Specific Purposes Classes at the higher education level. My, my name, <coughs> excuse me, my name is <coughs> Karen Ferreira Meyers. I work at the Institute of Distance Education of the University of Eswatini in Southern Africa, but I'm also a research fellow of the University of the Free State in South Africa, our neighboring country. This is an overview of my keynote, introduction, some limitations of traditional ESP teaching, and of course, learning, it goes hand in hand, the potential of immersive technologies for ESP, some examples from the virtual reality realm, from the augmented reality domain, and uh, some pointers on artificial intelligence before highlighting some of the benefits that these immersive technologies have over traditional ESP teaching and learning. And then I will, of course, conclude. Okay, I would like to start by uh, providing some uh, definitions of uh, key terms. Virtual reality refers to computer generated environment that simulates a physical presence in a real or imagined world. It involves the use of a headset or other immersive devices that provide users with a sensory experience, making them feel as if they are interacting with and existing within a simulated environment. Often used for entertainment, gamification, gaming, training simulations, and other applications. Then we have augmented reality. This involves the integration of digital information or virtual elements into the real world environment. So AR, AR, augmented reality, does not replace the real world, but enhances it, improves it by overlaying digital content onto the user's view of the physical world. So we can experience augmented reality through devices like you know, our smartphone, a tablet, smart glasses, um, or AI, uh, AR, specific headsets, used also in gamification, in gaming, in education, and industrial training and navigation. Then we have AI, which since November 2022 is uh, very much a hot potato, a hot topic in all our conversations in the educational world. It's a broad field of computer science um, where uh, Machines are created that are capable of performing, performing human-like tasks, learning, problem-solving, perceiving, understanding, etc. Now, when we look at uh, what technology has been doing in education, we know that uh, the use of ICTs has increased significantly, and um, there is emphasis on the use of these educational technologies with a focus on their adequacy. And uh, new applications in the education sector, which are enhancing pedagogy and providing new learning experiences for our students, uh, in particular for students with learning disabilities or time constraints. And that is according to Zane 2021. Mobile devices, tablets, uh, VR, AR, and all the AI uh, tools are now changing instruction and uh, really paving uh, a different educational world for all of us. Now, when we look at uh, what are the obstacles 
relating to con contextualization of language instruction to these varied and rapidly evolving professional demands, uh, we know that these are harder in foreign language environments where we work with limited authentic materials and language exposure outside the classroom. And this is particularly so in uh, your own um, in your own learning context. It is also so in my teaching and learning context, where even though language, uh, the language English is a second language, um, this is not always really the case when we look at how English is used. So what's the, what are the issues? A lack of authentic materials and language exposure, the gaps between what happens in the classroom and what happens in the workplace, the difficulty of keeping up with student needs that are constantly uh, changing, modifying, the, also the issue with teacher training and uh, professional development, where we seem to be unable to keep up with uh, all the different needs and also motivating uh, students, especially in uh, ESP teaching and learning environments. So one of the limitations of this uh, traditional ESP teaching and learning, we know that this is very teacher-centered still today. We use approaches that are one size fits all and that do not cater for personalized learning. Uh, we know that our access to the language is limited to classroom time, but also to teacher availability, and it's difficult to tailor and update uh, content and materials for the different uh, professions and the different needs that come out of the workplace. So these limitations in providing an immersive language environment and promoting active student participations have been underlined by UN in 2021. Um, Tulga in, 2020, in 2019 um, said that the use of VR and AR uh, can be a solution to um, these limitations by creating interactive and engaging learning environments and then the integration of AI in virtual reality technology can then also enhance the effectiveness of self-guided online courses in uh, English or uh, specific purposes, classrooms and environments. And that was noted in 2023, so very, very recent. The potential of these immersive technologies is wide. Virtual reality can simulate professional environments and scenarios. Augmented reality uh, can layer digital content, digital information onto real life settings. And the AI tutors and assistants uh, are there uh, to provide personalized guidance and give immediate and constant regular feedback. I'm citing a couple of uh, recent uh, papers here. Uh, where um, it has been found that the use of ICT and uh, VR platforms enhance language skills in general, but also critical thinking, creativity, and motivation. Um, and that uh, these immersive interacting learning technologies really play an essential role when it comes to the development of future uh, professionals. Then a couple of virtual reality examples, and I'm sure you can think of others, but uh, when we think of aviation, the students can be practicing pre-flight checks and communicating in a simulated cockpit. Uh, those in tourism or in the hospitality sector can be role-playing customer service scenarios with virtual guests. Engineers uh, can have meetings with their suppliers in a digital prototype lab and marketing uh, trainees that can give product pitches in a simulated conference hall. So all this is very useful. Virtual so reality Again, I'm citing a couple of uh, scholars like Pan 2021, who highlighted the benefits of VR in creating immersive uh, learning uh, environments. Uh, very, very important. Uh, VR uh, in English for academic purposes, uh, which can then also be uh, um, imitated in uh, ESP oh, so classes, and then a chunk of 
When we look at augmented reality, uh, there are some uh, important examples. Logistic students can access just in time terminology and phrases mapped on distributions and the workstations. Nursing students uh, can overlay anatomy diagrams onto medical while practicing clinical skills. Construction managers can be labeling equipment and components on site, again, using AR headsets. And we go back to the airline pilots who can augment pre-flight inspections with interactive virtual labels and instruction. So um, here we really note that uh, all this has shown to significantly enhance learning performance, confidence, and satisfaction, which is extremely important, as we all know, in uh, language learning. With AR, I'm sure we can all give lots of examples. I want to just use a few um, studies uh, to show the following, um, to show that the use of AI in ESP classes has really started to show promising results. Hockley 2023, but also Trego Wolf 2021 uh, highlighted the potential of these AI driven technologies. And they quoted in particular the chat box, the chat bots rather, and uh, voice recognition. Uh, these can be used to provide personalized feedback and support. And uh, this is in particular in ESP, but in all English uh, classes, important. Uh, where you work with specialized vocabulary, spe specialized um, jargon, and uh, academic language. Mukalafi, 2020, emphasized the need for uh, effective strategies when we apply AI to uh, ESP English teaching. Um, and then we need to think about all the downfalls, the possible pitfalls, like um, the bias, etc. Finally, um, some four big areas of where um, this immersive technology ESP teaching has significant benefits over traditional ESP teaching, higher engagement through interactive simulations. So we all know how important this engagement is when it comes to uh, language uh, learning. Also deeper learning, we note that when people do things while they are learning, whether in a uh, virtual uh, reality environment or in a real augmented reality environment, uh, we know that deeper learning occurs and there is that possibility of more personalized guidance powered by AI. So uh, really individual personalized pathways uh, are important in any type of, uh, of learning, in particular also in uh, ESP environments. Then flexible access that is not limited by our physical classrooms. We all know that in the environments we work at, um, the physical environments, the infrastructure is very often uh, problematic. So in conclusion, we know that the key obstacles um, in this area relate to contextualization of language instruction. And uh, that is very difficult to do well in a foreign language environment because First of all, we have limited authentic materials and language exposure outside the classroom. We know that VR um, immerses our users, so our ESP learners in computer generated environments. AR enhance real world environments with digital information. AI creates uh, machines that are capable of performing tasks that typically require human intelligence. But the goal of using all these tools in ESP is to replicate authentic professional environments and tasks for all our language learners. And this then allows them to bridge the gap between what happens in a classroom, be it a physical one or a virtual one, and the real world uh, language application that they so need. So we know that technology has the potential to enable customizable simulations for different occupations, different profession, and therefore respond to a variety of needs. 
and So Karen couldn't be with us today, but she has shared with us um, different technological tools, including virtual reality, augmented reality, and AI in the field of ESP and how these tools are proficient in enhancing the teaching of uh, different disciplines. All right, let's move on now to the third presentation to be presented by Professor Ahmed Shawqi Hwajli from Biskra University, Algeria. His presentation is entitled ESP Testing and Higher Education, Revisiting Some Fundamental Considerations and Procedures. And before Professor Hwajli starts, I would like to say some words about him and about his achievements so far. So, Professor Ahmed Shoukri Hwajli has a PhD in Applied Linguistics. He's full professor lecturer at the Department of English Language and Literature at Biskra University, Algeria. Uh, he taught and is teaching a number of courses, namely second language acquisition, academic writing, research methodology in language learning, grammar, and written expression. He's currently chairing two research units. The first is the Applied Linguistics and Language Assessment Research Unit, belonging to the Laboratory of Interdisciplinary Studies in, languages, uh, in Language and Culture. And the second is Developing Language Assessment Literacy for University Language Teachers, PRFU Unit. He headed a doctoral program in 2019-2020 and is supervising a good number of doctoral students. He chaired and participated in the organization of many national and international conferences. His research interests lie in applied linguistics, language evaluation and assessment, social linguistics, and psycholinguistics. So, Professor Ahmed Shawqi Hwajli, the floor is yours. Thank you, the chairperson. Uh, do you hear me well? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you um, very much. All right. Do you see the slides? Yes, we can see them. Okay. Uh, uh, can you move the slides? Can, can I? Shall can I? you move the slides or shall we move them for shall, you? Shall I start? Yes, yeah, the floor is yours. Hello. Mm. Professor Ahmed Shoukri Hwajli. Do you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Go okay. ahead, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Uh, welcome. I uh, would like, first of all, to welcome all of the online attendees. And uh, first of all, uh, I would like also to thank so much the organizers of this uh, event, this academic uh, event, this international conference uh, titled ESP Teaching at the Crossroads of the Marketplace. Uh, also, I would like to thank so much uh, the University of Tebessa for, for this invitation. And uh, great thanks go to the principal organizer of this academic event, Dr. Manel Mizab, um, for this invitation too. Uh, I would like also to say that I'm sorry I wanted to attend on-site this conference, but due to some uh, mitigating circumstances and uh, personal circumstances, I could not uh, travel to Tibisa. I apologize for this. So today I am going to present my work online. Uh, I go straight forward to the point, that is to my presentation. So my presentation is titled, it is titled um, uh, Assessment in ESP in Higher Education in Algeria, Revisiting Some Fundamental Considerations and Procedures. Uh, by the way, th this title has been revised uh, regarding the contents of the presentation. Um, it, to, to some extent, is uh, 
modified it has been modified to some extent is not the same as the one that appears on the conferences agenda okay uh, i would like uh, to tell you something about the background of my presentation so i have to read uh, my uh, my notes i have uh, that may appear on the, the the slides we can say that earlier studies are seen to emphasize on the lack of attention and interest within esp assessment however Recent studies are giving much more importance to this topic, despite the, the time that has been left behind in teaching of ESP, the assessment of it has not completely uh, been settled, and in most cases it is a challenge for ESP teachers. Uh, many studies uh, confirm that evaluation, assessment and testing are still a painful and challenging issue for almost all teachers of English. Some other studies indicate that a great deal of teachers are assessment literate. This simply means that they are not competent enough and proficient in designing and developing the assessment tools. In many cases, assessment in general English is confused with assessment in ESP. Um, in some, it is rec recognized that both GE, general English, and ESP teachers keep suffering from being unfamiliar with the principles of assessment that often make of them rely on invalid, unreliable, and an authentic tests. Just to recapitulate uh, this uh, uh, first uh, introduction regarding the background of the presentation, I can say that um, it has been noticed that uh, not only in ESP, but also in GE, General English, that assessment is uh, somehow not considered, not valued, uh, especially locally in Algeria. This is, this is because uh, among the most common practices, uh, assessment is, is usually, this is the problem, it's usually uh, reduced to only a very mere simple operation of assigning marks and scores to students. But in fact, in reality, assessment uh, uh, by, by and large is, the, uh, is a pillar uh, in addition to teaching and learning. Today, assessment is no more regarded only a, a very simple task of assignment scores, but it is a process that is integrated within teaching and learning. Something else regarding this background of the presentation, it is about uh, assessment literacy. So we can notice, and there's, there are, there's some evidence regarding some studies that show uh, that in Algeria, uh, m most of uh, uh, GE teachers and ESP teachers in particular, they are not assessment literate. This is this means they don't possess the enough enough um, uh, enough. Um, they do not possess the, the, the enough uh, uh, background knowledge on the Uh, regarding uh, many research studies in the local scene, still um, assessment uh, or these studies do not pay attention to this, th this research topic. So a great deal of researchers, mainly locally, ignore the importance of tackling this topic in the present time. For sure, this delays the consideration, the consideration of this topic. Uh, There are no, almost no research publications or research guide to ESP teachers on assessment. Likewise, there are almost no practical guidance about how to enable ESP teachers to design and develop the mainly um, to develop uh, mainly their uh, classroom testers. And also, we can say that it has also uh, been observed that both in-service and pre-service trainings for ESP teachers do not give the right value of assessment in ESP. So this is what has urged me and motivated me to tackle this research topic. Now, uh, concerning the presentation itself, I have raised the following question. That is, what are the fundamental considerations and procedures of assessment in English for specific purposes? I mean ESP. This research question has been subdivided into sub-research questions, for, uh, mainly four sub-research questions that are, first one, does assessment in ESP differ from assessment um, for general purposes. Second sub-research question is, what makes assessment 
in ESP more specific than assessment for general for general uh, purposes. And the third re sub research question is what are the aims of assessment in ESP? And finally, the last sub research question: what are some major challenges of ESP teachers? Teachers, um, let me show you the research questions and the sub research questions. Okay, what are some major challenges challenges uh, that um, ESP teachers encounter in the field of uh, uh, language assessment and ESP assessment? Now, uh, as a research methodology regarding this uh, work, this very modest work, we have opted for a, a, a purely descriptive study based on a literature review that has been conducted regarding the available works that has been done uh, on ESP and assessment locally and overseas. And also, it's based on the researcher's uh, personal uh, experience, considering that the researcher is uh, is uh, is um, is um, specialized in language assessment and evaluation. For ethical issues, the present presentation rests more on the literature found in an interesting book chapter by Selig, 2021. So you can have a look at this book chapter. I have found that almost the information presented in this book chapter are so interesting. Now uh, let's 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 answer some some questions that have been raised. Uh, the first one is: Does assessment in ESP differ from assessment for general purposes? We can say that considering that considering excuse me considering that ESP aim is to teach the language to enable its learners to communicate in a certain domain and perform effectively in a professional context using the language to achieve shared communication goals. So fundamental key issues are required by ESP teachers to make the latter different from general, um, uh, general, from general English. What are these key issues? These key issues are needs and genres that learners need to be able to articulate and contexts and discourses that they need to join. At this point, assessment in ESP requires a deeper understanding and more careful consideration for the analysis of needs from different perspectives. For a better and uh, a closer, uh, let's say, understanding of ESP assessment, we need to briefly refer to how an ESP course is designed in order to understand what defines and determines. A comprehensive approach to design an ESP course begins with the following. Firstly, an analysis of learning situation, which, which is merged with the theoretical views of learning. It helps to identify learners' attitudes, needs, and potential limitations of learning and teaching. Of target situation, which, merged, which, which is usually merged with the theoretical views of language, it helps to identify skills and knowledge needed to perform well in the target situation. Uh, uh, both uh, these two key issues often enables uh, teachers to write the syllabus and materials to benefit from the law in the acquisition of the skills and knowledge needed to the target. Now, uh, the answer to the second question, what makes, or first question, what, what makes assessment um, uh, uh, in ESP more specific than for general purposes, uh, we can say that evaluation and assessment are clearly seen to be de determined by all these components and steps. In this regard, to reiterate, assessment in ESP is determined by two major sources, the analysis of learning and more importantly, the analysis of target situation. To make the latter better, I mean, I uh, more comprehensive, the latter refers to professional information about the learners and the tasks and the activities they will be using in English. In more precise terms, terms, sorry, TSA, target situation analysis, is the prerequisite for ESP testers and assessment. It is regarded as the most important feature of ESP assessment. Now, uh, let me uh, I highlight uh, what are the major aims of assessment in ESP, so that we can understand the difference between ESP uh, assessment in ESP ESP and assessment in general English. Overall, we can say, by and large, assessment in ESP uh, aim is to give learners the opportunity to show what they are able to do, what they have learned, to showcase their progress uh, about what they need further, 
uh, to provide feedback to learners to help and support their learning, to help them build confidence and develop autonomy, and to see and to see if and how well they succeed in their target situation. More precisely, what makes an ESP assessment uh, specific uh, are these aims uh, that are concerned more with, with um, and they are very specific, and they, are, they take into consideration the following, the context, the context that addresses a particular area of language use. Examples here, we can state, for example, uh, finance, uh, nursing, medicine, uh, pre uh, finance, uh, etc. Also, we, we can consider what we call precision, and precision is about accurate, detailed, and jargonish, jargonish communication uh, uh, communication language. Uh, uh, the link between the knowledge for specific language and background knowledge of specific language, this is to perform a certain task because he or she has the knowledge of that specific, uh, specific uh, task. Now, what are some majors that, and ch uh, major challenges in ESP assessment? We can, uh, we can highlight these challenges. First, uh, assessment in ESP requ requires more consideration and deeper understanding. This is not only for ESP, it's only for GE. So we have to be aware that assessment, again, I repeat it, is not a mere operation of assigning marks. Assessment is a whole process. By assessment, we can learn, we can teach, we can know how our learning is effective, and we can know how, uh, uh, how our teaching sorry, is effective and how learning is, uh, uh, is adequate. Also, um, another challenge, it's that ESP teachers should be well equipped with knowledge, skills, and awareness of assessment in ESP teaching context, i.e., this simply means that uh, ESP teachers should be assessment literate in, uh, in assessment in general and in assessment in ESP in particular. And uh, next, that ESP, ESP teachers should uh, give more importance uh, to practice and to try to bridge the gap between practice and uh, theory so that they can know they can have a background of the a theoretical background of their practices and in practice they can use the appropriate procedures that help them to, 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 to realize by the end a valid authentic uh, interactive um, impactful and uh, re reliable uh, language assessment tools in the ESP uh, context overall we can say that from this exposition and in the line in line, sorry, with the new requirements of assessment in ESP, ESP uh, assessment can offer new opportunities to assess the ESP skills and competencies. In this respect, the design of valid, reliable, and authentic assessment tools requires that ESP teachers should be literate in assessment. This is what I have mentioned so far. In general, and in ESP in particular, obviously, this triggers these teacher, teachers to conduct research and look for practical concerns. Um, to recapitulate, we can say that e uh, assessment uh, in ESP is very challenging, is very interesting. What we need is to conduct more research studies and to be more um, aware of the requirements of, uh, of assessment in this field so that when it comes to um, design and develop uh, our language assessment uh, uh, tools, we can do that appropri appropriately and adequately. I'm sorry for this uh, very brief uh, presentation, and uh, I did it in a hurry because of uh, some problems. That uh, I would like to thank uh, 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 people from uh, the uh, how to say that Shabakat uh, Shabakat CRSC at Biskra University, uh, Mr. Sauli uh, Azdin and Mr. Ali Haif uh, for their assistance in, in in helping me to present this online presentation. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Professor Ahmed Shilki Hwajli, for this insightful presentation. Where Are you, you hearing me? Do you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. You finished, right? Uh, you're muted, Mr. Hwajli. Oh, do you hear me? 
Yes, I can hear you. Uh, have you heard my presentation? Yes, we have. And you have finished. Have I have you? finished. Thank you very much indeed. Okay. I would like right. to thank you, Mr. The Chairperson, and thank uh, Dr. Menal Mizab, the principal organizer of this conference. I wish you the best of luck, uh, dear colleagues at Tibisa University. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Huajli, for sharing this insightful presentation where you shared with us the difference between ESP and EGP, and your focus was much more on assessment in both these types of Englishes. Um, uh, you shared with us how assessment is done in ESP and how it is more specific than the one done in general English, because in ESP we are much more interested in TSA, that is target situation analysis and needs analysis, and we are also interested in how to assess um, students' outcomes after we apply the curricula and the syllabi. Exactly. Thank you very much. Very good uh, feedback. Thank you very much indeed. And recapitulation. Thank you. This Thank is the you. chairperson. Now, we're moving to the discussion part. If you have any questions, the ones who are online, if you have any questions, please drop them in the chat box and we can start the discussion right away. All right. Any questions? So we have no questions online, but I would like to um, add a comment and maybe a question afterwards about uh, Dr. Wasile's presentation, which was about EMI in Algeria. So, according to uh, teachers' attitudes and the, the, the challenges they are facing and the way they are being taught in, uh, in this training, we can see that neither EAP, neither CLIL, nor EMI are or is implemented uh, adequately in order to train teachers to teach their subject matters in English. Because generally uh, in this kind of training, we are, we are not teaching ESP because in ESP we, fo we focus much more on introducing scientific terminology or the terminology that's specific to a certain discipline. We're not using EMI because teachers uh, are taught general English without any reference to their uh, fields of specialties. Uh, we are not teaching uh, English through curriculum because we don't have any curricula or syllabi to, uh, that are dedicated to teaching ESP or EMI. So the question is, um, how to um, join uh, efforts of stakeholders at both the micro level and the macro level in order to get um, adequately designed curricula and syllabi that go hand in hand with the needs of this target group who are university teachers of different specialties. Um, thank you, Manal. Um, I think this is a question for discussing and discussion for all of us, not just me. Yeah. <laughs> so the um, I can't provide like a, um, an adequate answer because we need to go to the field and see what they are doing inside their classrooms. For now, I just have like a ways of thinking uh, what is in their mind, uh, like attitude and preparedness. 
but when we go to the classroom we can learn more how they struggle in which matter they struggle so as we can join the efforts like we can have like efforts from english departments to help them improve their language at the same time we can have it like a cooperation with foreign foreign like foreign uh, universities to provide them with the knowledge expertise at least to gain some materials in there so as they can implement them in the context of algeria because um some of the teachers mentioned that we need to depart from esp to go to emi because they think if they don't have like the key terminologies they couldn't teach uh, in english accurately so mm -hmm. that joined um and like th that joined of uh, stakeholders from esp expertise and english like general english teachers they can help them to like um, um have a quality um like a quality education for their learners in their subject matters and uh, another solution that i can think about is that i can see that most of the uh, keynote speakers spoke about ai um, AI as well can help them in uh, getting the materials in English because it can help them get the materials in English readily. At the same time, they need to understand what they are getting from AI, not just getting it and put, putting it into uh, slides or uh, like handouts and give it to students because students will struggle as well if they do mm. that. So they can get AI help, ESP practitioners to help them learn their subject matters in English, as well as the general uh, English uh, help to get their language uh, confidence, because some of them, if they don't feel confident in speaking the language, they will not feel confident in teaching the subject matter in English. Uh, so this is what I can say for now, but future research can also give us empirical evidences, not just like uh, opinion-based evidence. Yes, okay. indeed. Yeah, we can't simply uh, take into consideration opinions and try to implement a whole new framework uh, without preparing for it, without studying the needs of, yeah, without studying the needs of the target group. Um, so, for example, I'm, I'm going to share something from my experience and something that has been shared yesterday as well by uh, one of the keynote speakers and who is the manager of the Center of Intensive Language Teaching in Oran at Oran 2 University. So, at first, we agreed that only, so after administering a placement test, we agreed that only the ones with A1 and A2 are supposed to study general English. But the ones with B1 and above are supposed to study ESP. Um, and we needed some programs and materials to teach this group. But it turned out that everybody, whatever the level is, uh, is studying general English using manuals that have been designed decades ago. Um, so we couldn't figure out how to, and even the trainees, I mean, the, the learner, teacher learners uh, of the language are wondering why we are studying in general English all over again, while we have some basics in the language and we can communicate our thoughts. So why not delve into the specificities of our specialties in the target language so that we will teach that content in English. They also wondered about the teaching methods and the teaching techniques that they may use because as teachers of scientific fields they do not focus much more on didactics that is and pedagogy that is how to uh, deliver a certain content in an efficient and effective manner to the learners so they they raised questions about uh, several matters uh, and they are right by the way um, but we, we couldn't, in reality, we couldn't have those uh, pillars of teach or of such a training uh, implemented well. Um, I believe that uh, these uh, concerns should be shared with higher authorities, maybe at the macro level, because uh, not only us, uh, I mean, teachers of such a training, but 
conferences, recommendations from conferences. Uh, Algerians now are trying to conduct research in EMI and publish articles about it. So why not higher authorities take into consideration our recommendations? Because we are the ones in, in the field. We are there to give our experiences for higher authorities to consider and to um, make decisions accordingly. Yeah, that's right. I join you in what you are saying. We need yeah. both top down and bottom up because uh, when we look at the teachers as policy makers, we can also look at the government as uh, like an initiator to the policy. So yeah. that joint um, cooperation between the two may, may make a mediation to a better quality of EMI programs. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. <laughs> so we hope to find solutions as soon as possible yeah. with the help yeah. of all the researchers in different I fields, even in the, the departments of uh, different departments, not just the English yes. department. Yeah, actually, this uh, uh, Dr. Wafa Feli, the manager of the sale at uh, Oran 2 University, is having some groups, limited groups this year, to study ESP. And they had a certain manual, I forgot about its name, she told me about it yesterday, uh, th that is dedicated to uh, a certain field, I think economics, yes. But again, I, I don't agree with the idea of taking materials that are designed abroad for a certain context and just implement them in our context. That's true. Because, yeah. Because we need to conduct needs analysis first, see what the target group needs, wants, what are their lacks, what are their necessities, and afterwards we can adapt those materials and programs or we can design new ones that dovetail with their needs. Yeah, because we need to tailor it to the local context. For example, one of the participants told me like, what if we don't know the word in English and we struggle to explain it to the students at that time? What can we do? We, yeah. we need to use our native language in that matter. So that makes yeah. it like EMI will be moving from EMI to multilingual classrooms using the English as well as other languages available to them. Yeah, and in fact, this is what's happening because the teachers we taught last year um, are supposed to teach uh, their subject matters in English this year, but they reported that they can't, or they couldn't, because, and they said they suggested that they would tell their students about the terminology in English, but when it comes to lesson delivery, it's going to be in English or French. That is the way they used to do it. We need to embrace it because it's it's our translanguage and practices in the Algerian it's, context. Translanguaging yeah. is is privilege in the different languages we have, and we use them for for um, at the exposal of the students because they already know those languages. When we give them a term in their language, it will be easier for them to understand, and uh, in the future they can implement it in English because they already understand it clearly. What does it mean? And yeah. um, um, if you can let me share like the uh, finding of one of the Vietnamese studies, she studied with me and she conducted like an EMI program in her country, um, mm -hmm. looking for the both attitudes and uh, practices of the lecturers. She found that translanguaging is there. They couldn't use just English in their classrooms. Vietnamese is uh, like the first language they can use whenever they struggle to find anything um, not easy. So like this thing is already found, like translanguaging, like is a solution for them if they struggle to use just English language. Yeah. Yeah, very interesting. So this is one of the recommendations that we're going to adopt for this conference. So maybe for those teachers who know their subject matter in English and still struggle with the way of delivering that content in English, they may resort, <clears throat> sorry, to translanguaging. Yeah. Yeah. Another question which is raised here is uh, the other side, that is whom this content is delivered, that is the students. Um, the teachers reported that they would find difficulties in teaching a generation, the Z generation, that is a generation that masters uh, 
nearly masters English because um, they use technology a lot and everything online is mostly in English. So uh, what I can say in this matter, um, yeah, I can see like some worries from the teacher's yeah. part. They think if their accent is not equivalent to the student's accent, especially when they have American English or British English. So they feel like um, embarrassed to teach their stu students who already have higher proficiency in English than themselves. Mm -hmm. But what I can say for the teachers, uh, it doesn't matter your leveling in English because we are now in, a, in, in an era of lingua, uh, language as a uh, lingua franca. So English as lingua franca. It doesn't matter whether you have a good accent or a bad accent. As far as you know your knowledge, you know your content. So they should feel confident in their shoes, whether the language, whether the accent is Algerian or uh, British or American. Uh, as far as the um, they can deliver the content in an easy manner for their students. It's true that they will feel embarrassed at the beginning, but later on they feel that their students, they don't have the knowledge. They have the English, but not the knowledge. Mm -hmm. Exactly, yes. Right. Um, this topic, as we said earlier, needs joining all efforts from everyone so that we would be able to shape it in uh, an adequate manner. Yeah. And we can also have expertise from uh, assessment as well, as I said. Yes. Like, for example, Professor Ahmed, if you can share with us your views in terms of uh, EMI and assessment, it would be like fruitful because when we look at it from the term of assessment, it's true that we have EMI, but how can we assess the students in that policy, in that program? So how can we assess their success? Is it the language success or the knowledge success? What, is, what does it matter in EMI and assessment in your field? Uh, thank you. Thank you, dear colleague, for this uh, very interesting question. Uh, I think, I, think um, uh, assessment, I, would, I would say that assessment uh, in general is very challenging. Uh, let me say that assessment in GE, in general English, is very challenging. It's very challenging. Now, when we, when we talk about ESP, as I was talking uh, so far, has been talking so far, and now regarding EMI, so assessment also is very challenging. So, but we have to know that when we talk about assessment in GE, it's different from e assessment in ESP. And of course it is different from um, assessment in, um, in EMI. What we require, what we need first is, is that uh, all of them, they share the same thing. That is, we have to know the basics, uh, the fundamentals regarding uh, what should, be, what we as teachers either uh, GE teachers, ESP te teachers, or EMI teachers, we should have a certain background, certain knowledge, certain uh, skills, certain... To, uh, let's say, uh, when it comes to... Um, to, to the Uh, internet connectivity we problem. Assess knowledge. Do you hear me? Uh, now we can hear. Can now, yeah. Do you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Normally. <laughs> Do you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Do you hear me? Yes, we can. We can hear you. Dr. Wasila? Yeah, we can hear you. Because you, Do you your hear connectivity me? Is, is cutting. Yeah, we can hear you now. Do you hear me, Dr. Wasila? Yeah, I can hear you. Just sometimes it's it's cutting and freezing. Do you hear me? <laughs> yeah. Of the net. Problem yeah, sometimes it's cutting and other times it's freezing. So, but we got your IDs. Do you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, you now. Hear me now? Yeah. Um, I think that uh, there is some, some background that we should have. Then go. Do you
yeah, now we can hear you. It appears like uh, Professor Hwajli has a Hello? problem with internet connectivity. I, I, yes, we can hear you okay. now. It's okay? Okay. Yes, uh, go I ahead. Think there is a problem with, with, the, with the net. So <coughs> I, I was talking about the, the, the idea that usually we should have a background. We cannot be good assessors, uh, good evaluators, and uh, good testers uh, in EMI or in ESP if we don't have this background. So we need to have this background. That means we need to be assessment literate first. In, in, in general English, then we need to know more because there is another chance regarding spe specific subjects, for example, EMI or uh, ESP. Of course, uh, there, is, there is difference between, between, um, between uh, general English and EMI in the sense that in EMI, assessment is very specific. It's very specific. It requires, uh, it requires to, to assess specific, uh, specific elements. So uh, here, uh, our focus, should it be on? Uh, uh, language, uh, master of language, or uh, on the master of the subject. I think uh, when it comes to uh, uh, EMI assessment, folks should be on um, uh, how uh, how these how the learners achieve well, how the learners progress well in the subject matter. And I open brackets here. We have to know that even within assessment, we have to consider two elements that are the types of tests. Is it, are we, are we, are we, are we assessing uh, learners' achievement? Are we assessing learners' uh, progress? Are we assessing uh, learners' proficiency? Because based on the answers to these questions, we can choose the type. And for each type of question, uh, type of tests, uh, we have to devise spe specific test tasks and test items. Something else. What is the aim of assessment? Are we assessing just to, uh, to, 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 to grade students, to select? to diagnose to, 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 or to do something else? Or, because based on the aims and based on uh, the uses of the test, we, are, we have to make uh, inferences, we have to take decisions. So again, uh, let me go and answer you precisely. I can see and I can say that uh, when it comes to e EMI assessment, I think, I think this is my point of view based on what I have read about previous uh, uh, literature, it is that folks should be on uh, uh, assessing the subject matter more than to focus on assessing uh, the knowledge. Yeah, By thank you way. so much. Can I, can I inter interrupt? One word, one word, one word to finish. Okay. I think, I think uh, this topic assessment in Algeria, I think it's very challenging, very, very challenging. Uh, for devise uh, a conference for ESP and assessment or EMI and assessment so that we can be more well-versed in this topic and this may help us, of course, to become literate and uh, proficient and competent in assessment in any of, uh, in any of the different fields. Thank you. Thank you. Just I wanted to add something, if you allow me, of course. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Um, so um, when we look at the EMI um, program now, so we are giving like another um, hurdle to the teachers as well, because they are embarking to a new program and they uh, struggle in the English language, as well as they will struggle in the assessment because they will be lost whether to assess the language. Because if sometimes when we don't have like a um, meaningful sentence, we couldn't understand what the students will be delivering. But at the same time, if we let the teachers understand that errors does not define the um, knowledge or in subject matter, will help them at least to ease the process of assessment. Because as, as it is now, some of the teachers still now, still uh, re recognize that English should be accurate in their delivery. And it, it's, it, like it, it is interpreting in some way like how they can view the students if they don't um, uh, provide like an accurate sentence or an accurate communication in their uh, exams, they would score them low because they think the language matter more than the subject matter. So uh, I think we need to, uh, when we train them, we need to make them aware. We can use ELF, English as Lingua Franca perspective, which uh, requires looking at the communication instead of the accuracy of the language. If you can join me, Manel, in this. Yes, of course. Um, since we're talking about English as a lingua franca, 
nowadays, we are no longer interested in accuracy. What matters is that we deliver the message. We, uh, if someone misses the third person singular s, that's not a problem at all because the problem, the, the message is understood. So we are much more interested in fluency and getting the message through to the other. Yeah. Thank you. All right, I have two questions here on the chat box. What about, so Adel here says, what about delivering the content um, and assessment for a mixed group of level of brain, branches of ages for the students of vocational training? So we can just read the... Yes, it's there. Okay, what about delivering the content and assessment for mixed group level? Uh, they mean the, for the teachers or for the students? Students, students of vocational training. Okay, so um, if I understand well the question, they mean how about uh, giving like a training for these vocational students, uh, yes. including both content and assessment? Yes. So uh, I think it is good to include both uh, content and assess assessment practices because um, they are joined because we cannot we cannot track the progress of the student if we don't know about assessment. And at the same time, the content of the subject matter is important because uh, what I get from his question uh, is that um, is that when we have the uh, different group of students, um, they will struggle if they don't know the assessment practices, so we better give them content and how to assess it, if that, that's his question. I agree on that because sometimes if we if we like if we know the um, content well, but we don't know how to assess it, that means the student will be struggling, that the student will be at loss because they will receive content, but they haven't received like a um, a well informed criteria of assessment. So I agree on that, like joining both of them uh, while teaching the training the students. Of course, yes. And this, it's better to, at the beginning of the course, to inform the students about the objectives of the course and the goals, what they are going to be achieving at the end of the course. And this includes giving them the syllabus, that is the content they are going to study throughout the course, and giving them the mode of evaluation, including assessment. Um, when we talk about assessment, we can uh, inform the students about formative assessment and summative assessment, how they are going to be, uh, to be given feedback throughout the course and how they are going to be assessed at the end of the course. Yeah, and again, the teachers should clarify in their mind what exactly. they see as a good assessment. Yeah, because if like, they don't clarify it, that will be mm -hmm. like, okay, um, I give you the criteria, but then I will have subjectivity while I assess your your uh, content. Exactly. So it's not only uh, about telling the students how to assess them, but it's better to give them the criteria of assessment as well. So, for example, I teach written expression, um, so. I tell the students that these are the criteria that I need to have in your written compositions because afterwards I'm not going to assign a random mark to what you have written, but I'm going to follow those criteria in order to give the final mark. Yeah, to be fair enough, because yes. that, that, is, that, is, that is more related to inclusivity and fairness in assessment. Yes. Exactly. Because yeah. the content and the assessment are related to inclusivity. So when we give a quality content and then we assess them wrongly, that means they are not receiving an equality or equal exactly. education. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Okay. We have another question for from uh, Ikram. Uh, in what ways? Yeah. In what ways does the proficiency level of teachers in English impact the quality of education delivered in classrooms? where English is the medium of instruction. 
Okay, thank you, Ikram, for the question. Um, that's very interesting. Well, uh, according to my participant, I will I will speak on their tone because they are the more um, like uh, concerned ones than me. So, um, so as I said, it all depends on their attitudes towards English. If their attitudes is is towards accuracy and fluency and uh, being proficient in the language, that means it will impact their delivery because they will freak out, they will be showing such, uh, signs of apprehension and anxiety while teaching, and they will affect the quality of delivery because they will not feel at ease of saying anything they want as they used to in their French or Arabic uh, delivery. Um, but for those teachers who have the attitudes of, uh, of whatever they say is fine, uh, the errors is fine, the mistakes they make, they are fine, as far as the content is good, and as far as they can have their, uh, like their examples on, on the board, they can give them a handouts that are uh, informative, that, that will not really affect the quality because they can handle their ways, they are flexible in that matter even if their language proficiency is not B2 or something is not advanced like an English language speaker, but at least they, they can play around the, the proficiency they have in delivering content. So it all depends on the attitudes of the teachers. So this is my answer for that. It depends on the attitudes of the teachers to, towards English language. If they see it as a, a tool for delivering content, even if they are not highly proficient in there that will not affect their delivery but if they see it as a, a barrier not a tool to deliver um if they don't have like if they have low language proficiency that means it will affect their delivery for sure because they will be very anxious at that time of delivery and they will not feel comfortable in their shoes like facing the students who are already in high level of english I hope I answered my, your question, Ikram. Yes, you, you did, you did. And she said, thank you so much, Professor. Okay, thank you. <laughs> All right, we have another question from Rahima. Uh, she says, sorry. Okay, so we can read it here. Um, uh, thank you, Rahima, for the uh, question. So you said if teaching EMI in, in Algerian classrooms doesn't affect the learning of other subjects in a negative way, of course. So um, what I can say in this matter, can you hear me, Manal? I think you're frozen. Okay. <laughs> internet uh, cutting out okay uh, she left Manel. uh doctor okay let me see okay uh, i hope they can uh, listen to us in there because the, the internet is coming go ahead go ahead i can oh, hear you okay because i was waiting for you i thought you yeah i, I lost the connection from my pc so i joined the technicians okay <laughs> yeah. That's fine. So, um, teaching EMI in Algerian classrooms, um, I I'm trying to get the, her question. So, she wanted to know if the teaching of EMI in Algerian classrooms does not affect the learning of other subjects in a negative way, of course. What do what do, what does she mean by other subject? The learning of other subjects, like, is she here asking about whether the link between EMI and the content of other subjects will be affected negatively or what she, this is what I'm, I'm trying to understand yes yeah so uh this is what i got from her question as well um i think she means uh other subjects rather than english uh, yeah i mean uh, yeah the other scientific yes. and law and psychology yeah, so if we teach the subjects in english wouldn't that affect the learning of the the subject matter content negatively uh well when we when we look at the um the conceptualization of emi it's focusing on the subject matter rather than the language because as i said uh when we embark to an emi classroom it is not uh, embarking to teach the language 
the, it should be like a mistake if the teachers are, are going there to teach the language. It is their role should be like teaching the subject matter, whatever their language proficiency. So um, again, it's related to the previous question. So whatever the teacher is going there with an, an attitude of teaching the subject matter, that will not affect the, the learning because they, they know their role is to deliver the content of their subject matter in English or in other language if they wish to, because sometimes it will happen for them to use other languages. But then um, one way that may, that may affect the subject matter is that if the teacher walk into the classroom and they think that they are not ready enough to give a content in English, and they think their like their uh, language proficiency is not is is not enough to give like key terminologies. In that matter, yes, it will affect it negatively, because the student will not get the um, content, the accurate content. Like they will not get the key terminologies. For example, when we look at um, psychology, like uh, cognitive behaviors and everything. So the, if the if the teachers cannot give them those terms like cognition and everything, they will struggle later to understand it in their um, in their future learning. So it all depends on the teacher, how they uh, approach the EMI classroom. So if, if you ask my position, um, I think I should walk into the classroom with an attitude that makes me at ease to teach whatever the tool that I can use. If I can use multimedia in, in, in the projector to show them the content, that would be better because that would explain more key terminologies. And then I will do some discussions with them uh, to make them like learn on their uh, own uh, languages of this, uh, like the languages at their disposal. So I, and uh, another thing that um, I may do if I were, if, if I am, if I were in their shoes, I, I, I can also give the preference to the students inside the classroom to discuss the content in the language they know. Like that, at least the, the teacher will ensure they, they, un, they can understand. Because as I said, their role is not to teach English. Their role is to teach the subject matter. So if they allow them to speak in any language, to understand each other and to discuss the subject matter, that will be turning into positive uh, yeah. So that's what I yes. Mean. Interesting, Wasila. Thank you so much for sharing these insights. And this would answer the next question by Esma. Okay. Who is asking about the strategies that EMI teachers can adopt to teach effectively? Yeah, I think so, it's related to the previous question, yes, which is like, already, yeah. yeah. So strategies, they, the teachers can uh, can work their ways. When they go to the classroom to uh, like to implement EMI, they can see what they can do better. Um, like I can suggest they can do re a reflective feedback at the end of their classes, giving them a reflective feedback for their students, telling them, okay, what do you think is good in this session today? Do you think uh, I, I delivered, I, like I was uh, um, explaining enough for you or you think you need more? Like that, they can improve their proficiency, like pro profession of teaching in English. They would tell the student will, of course, they will comment on everything, on the language as well as the content. We know all the context, but we can, uh, they can give them a strategy. So some of the uh, students will tell them, okay, we want to see more of discussion. We want to see more of uh, like videos that explain this in, in key terms. So they can work, work their ways using like technology as well as the languages available in the classroom is the best way instead of just using English alone if they think that will be a struggle. Yeah, thank you so much, Rashida. Another question, I, I think this is the last by Marwa. She said, I would like to ask to what extent EMI aims to enhance students' English language proficiency while delivering academic content in the target language? Okay, so uh, EMI, it will improve the student proficiency to some extent, but not completely, because as I said, EMI is not having, like an initial aim of EMI is not improving the language of the student. 
but just delivering the content in English. Uh, at the same time, they will have like an improvement in their English language because they are forced to um, ex take exams in English, discuss some time in English, that will help them. Even they don't know the language at the first place, through the EMI course, they will get some language proficiency to some extent yes. they need uh, some other courses general and esp courses for them but emi is the subject matter yes exactly <laughs> so here it's just to raise this this issue of not being frustrated of the language because in emi our focus is on the subject matter much more so English is there only as a medium of instruction. So if the students cannot understand on, and if the teacher cannot use the language adequately, they can resort to other languages to deliver the content easily. Yeah, this is my, it is completely fine to yes. shift from languages, uh, one language to another, given that we are multilingual and we should be proud of it, not just exactly. being like, okay, we implement English to develop the, um, the, like the national aims of going to the global but at the mm -hmm. same time we will feel at ease to teach easily and explaining the content easily yeah all right thank you so much <laughs> Wasila. uh professor ahmed shawqi would you like to add anything yeah thank you i, I have noticed that focus is on emi today we talk about emi english as a medium yeah. is really uh, it's interesting because people are, are are now we can see even most of the teachers at the university level that are looking how to teach with english language and i join uh, dr wasila and dr menel too when they say when you said that uh, focus is on the subject matter focus is not on language language if we can say in Arabic, it's obvious. You should have a certain proficiency in language. Focus is on, on the subject matter and how to teach this subject matter using that language. Now, for, for us, it's something that is a very, between brackets, very new. But I think with time, people will be acquainted with the, the, this, uh, this issue that is EMI and things will be better in the future. But I just yes. want to come back again to talk about assessment. What I am, uh, what I'm observing in the local scene, is that assessment. I'm not talking about uh, ESP or EMI only. I'm talking about e assessment in general. In Algeria, it's totally neglected. But in fact, assessment is is not, as I said in my present, it's not just giving marks, assigning marks. It's a process. We need as teachers to be competent, proficient, proficient in. in in, as, in, ES, uh, in assessment, um, so we can, for example, uh, include assessment uh, modules in, in training and pre-training um, uh, in, uh, services so that we can uh, well what is assessment. And I add something and I confirm what uh, Dr. Wasila has said, that is what Dr. Wasila has said so far. Uh, in assessment, it is usually also recommended to inform learners about the assessment procedures so that you, they won't be uh, surprised. They won't be surprised when they, uh, the, they get uh, the feedback or they get the score. So they have to know how they are assessed, the procedures, the way they are assessed. They have to be informed about this. Uh, this. Uh, if we manage to uh, make these students aware of the, 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 this thing, that is, the assessment procedures. This may uh, give uh, more benefit for learners and teachers regarding assessment. And just uh, because I, th I think this is the end, uh, uh, before I say a word uh, at the end, just I call you as uh, university researchers, why not in the future? We, we have to, to work on assessment in ESP and assessment in EMI uh, for, uh, in, in, in separate, let's say, uh, events, academic, National study days or conferences or international conferences. Um, allow me, okay, because I think we have come to the end. Just I thank so much again, Dr. Menel, for this invitation. Thank you very much, uh, good lady, for this invitation and giving me, me this opportunity to participate in this academic event. And uh, thank you uh, also for Dr. Wasila. I have uh, enjoyed your presentation, your answers to that questions. It was very, very, very interesting. Thank you very much indeed. And thank you very much also indeed for all the online attendees that are present with us.
Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Thank Ahmed. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you yeah, so thank much. You, if, you like, if you let me uh, add just two things. Sure, sure. Go ahead. So uh, just to answer the questions in a, in, in a more uh, like scenario way, uh, when we go back in time to our policies in Algeria, we can see that teachers um, they were teaching in French as a medium of instruction for the subject of science, technology, and everything. But when we look at their level of English, uh, le level of French is not that high, is not that proficient. They can deliver the content in French because we know it's it's part of our language as well. We speak in French sometime in our Algerian Derja. Um, so uh, it's the same in English. We are moving to the English as a medium of instruction with an idea that we can use it to communicate, not to be proficient on it, just to communicate the content. And the students can also improve their English as they did when they were learning in French as a medium of instruction. They have some um, like communication skills in French but I, I know some friends that who, who were taught in French as a medium of instruction, they are not so proficient, but they can communicate their content in French. So that's what I mean, like we can have this balance between English as a medium of instruction and French as a medium of instruction. It would be the same if we join the efforts. Um, thank you so much, Manel, for inviting me. Thank you, Ahmed uh, Shoke, for your presentation. And thank you for all the speakers who shared their ideas and uh, insights in um, this conference towards ESP and EMI trends. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing your insightful thoughts, your studies with us. Uh, they are beneficial in making decisions in the future. Thank you. Yeah. So... See you when I see you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take care.